So uh, as Rob said, my name is Reid Vanderwill. I am a technical solutions engineer for Puppet Labs. And this talk is ambitiously titled, Puppetizing Multi-Tier Architecture. Um, it is a 40 minute talk, so my objective is primarily going to be kind of to lay out what the considerations are, what all the moving pieces are, what you have to think about when you're doing it. It's not gonna be like a, you know, this is exactly what you should do. It's kind of, this is one way of accomplishing it. Uh, but hopefully it should be interesting. So real quick, I'm gonna start with sort of um, what I do. So at Puppet Labs, I am a technical solutions engineer. What that basically means is that it is my job to go on site and talk to customers and prospective customers about problems that they're having. Talk about um, servers, talk about management, talk about sort of the old ways of doing things, whether it's golden images or shell scripts or manually SSH into a box and run, run a script and you know, uh, do a thing. Um, and so we also talk about you know, automation. Uh, we talk about Puppet. We talk about moving to, from these kinds of methodologies, uh, which are you know, inconsistent and result in configuration drift and servers with different personalities, talk about moving to something that allows consistency, repeatability, um, automation. I would talk about, like I said, basically Puppet. This talk today um, is loosely structured around a particular problem. And like the problems I talk about uh, every day, it's a problem around automation. Um, what made this problem interesting and what brought it to my attention, uh, I guess that's a pretty, pretty direct way of saying it, is the problem was actually mine. Um, the problem was one that my, my own team dealt with on a daily basis. So, Technical solutions engineering is mostly about um, talking to other people and helping them kind of understand automation. Uh, but my team also was responsible for managing and deploying for ourselves and for customers on occasion uh, an application. Um, as it was indicated in my talk title, um, and it's kind of ironic, uh, you know, I work for an automation company, but the application I'm talking about automating uh, is actually Puppet Enterprise itself. Um, so Puppet Enterprise, you know, we present it as well, I guess the, the interesting thing about it is that although we present it as this unified sort of packaged offering that you, you lay down and it stands up and it's all ready to go and you don't think too much about it, once you explode it all out, it's basically a pretty, pretty typical web application. It's got an application or a web tier in the middle, that's the Puppet Master Service, it's got the database backend, that's Puppet DB and Postgres, and it's got um, you know, a console service on the front end. Um, and Okay, so wait a second, I said there's a problem. I said, uh, well, what is the problem? So we have this application, but no, it's not, maybe it's not using Puppet specifically, but uh, it's pretty automated. It's pretty easy to install. Um, you know, it's packaged up into a, a scripted interrogator. It asks you a bunch of questions and then lays down automatically one of two kind of cookie cutter deployments. Um, it's either a single system monolithic install where you have the, web, the database tier, the web tier, and the, the user front end stuff all pile onto a single server. You know, ask, answer some questions and it gives you this. Or alternatively, maybe it'll split these roles out for you into three different systems. You know, separate database, separate uh, application layer, and a separate console. Cool. So still isn't a problem, right? Uh, the, the issue was that although these, one of these two cookie cutter deployments is gonna cut it for, I'm gonna make up a number here, maybe 80% of the company's customers you know, by the numbers, I'm the guy on my team who spends all of my time working with the other people, the people for whom one of these two cookie cutter deployments, for one reason or another, just isn't enough. It isn't gonna cut it, right? Okay, so maybe somebody has a need for high availability. And you know, if you have a single monolithic server, this is a pretty easy problem to solve at the virtualization layer. Uh, you know, you basically just replicate that, use VMware's HA or, um, what's the other one, fault tolerance, what have you, good to go. Uh, maybe, uh, but the problem is some people have needs where you, that isn't gonna work. They need to have high availability at the application layer. So what do we do? We stand up one of these cookie cutter deployments, whichever size they need, and then we go in and manually set up HA options for them. We set up cron jobs, we set up file synchronization, we set up database replication, whatever they need. We manually go in and configure it, manually, okay? All right, so that's one option. Maybe somebody needs geodiversity. So they already have, uh, you know, this simple, simplest case, we have two data centers, they want one experience or one central control console for everything. So we set up a cookie cutter deployment in each data center, just for kind of locality and uh, speed. And then we have to do something, we have to manually go in and, con and configure those two systems to interconnect. Maybe there's a central control console somewhere else, but we have to set up that kind of not cookie cutter configuration ourselves. And kind of finally, and this is probably really common, is we have users have needs for massive throughput, where you know, even the split installation is not enough for their, their uh, you know, the number of puppet agents they have uh, using the system. So it's, architecturally, it's a really simple problem to solve. This is a web application. What you do is you take the application layer and you replicate that out to as many nodes as you need and you put them all behind a load balancer. Seems simple, except again, because it's not automated using something like Puppet, how we do this is we stand up the three-way install, then we manually replicate the application instances as many times as we need and configure the HA, uh, excuse me, the load balancer. So basically, we had what architecturally was a flexible, scalable, you know, somewhat elastic multi-tier web application that we were going in on a regular basis, 
uh, and manually reconfiguring from one of two starting points uh, for the same kinds of deployment scenarios over and over again. So wait a second. We have a tool to solve this. To cut a long story short, um, I became a member of a, of a project team that was given the go ahead to go ahead and actually puppetize or develop a puppet driven automation for this application. Um, that was a pilot project. Um, it was successful, and the results of that are kind of now percolating outwards. Um, but in the process of doing it, I personally learned a lot about sort of how to think about puppetizing and modeling a multi tier application like this for a system that spans multiple systems. Um, and that's what this presentation is kind of built around. Um, the agenda for today, now that I've kind of set the context for where this is coming from, and at least where I picked up what I, what I think I know, um, is to go over, uh, it's only a 40 minute talk, so there's only so much you can do, right? It's kind of the, the multi-tier challenge. How do you actually define in Puppet an application that's not just a classification for a single node, but actually something that spans multiple systems? So once you have that definition, how do you actually deploy it, map it onto real infrastructure, real, um, real systems or virtual machines? Um, that's you know, mapping it, classification. And finally, wait a second, it's, it's important oftentimes to actually have dependencies and relationships between these systems, so how do you actually deploy it, or how do you push updates to it? Um, and uh, I'm gonna stick within the bounds today of sort of what you should do with Puppet and just kind of expose the areas where you might wanna integrate with an external utility, um, but hopefully it'll give a, a mental model for working with this sort of application. All right, so starting with how do we actually define a multi-tier application in Puppet? So the first thing to come to grips with um, when setting out to model a multi-tier application is it's most of the core published methodologies around Puppet are fundamentally node-centric because Puppet, um, at least when you're building a catalog and modeling a system, is all about a single, a single machine. Okay? I'm pointing out that Puppet's usage and methodology is often node-centric not because nodes are irrelevant to multi-tier applications, but because we are going to um, relatively quickly or at some point want to make an intentional paradigm shift and stop thinking about the, the individual node um, only and think in addition to or possibly instead of think of the application as the entity that we care about Okay, but puppet is all about building abstractions So before we actually get to that problem um, at the bottom layer of the language we have things like you know uh, resource primitives uh, Files services packages. We have classes. We actually do have to think about the individual nodes So on day one of puppetizing puppet enterprise the first thing we have to do is actually is uh, is kind of think about okay all, all of the methodologies for puppetizing a single system do apply because we have to get them finished first before we think about connecting all of the pieces together. So first thing we actually did is we said, all right, let's take our, the application we want to have and let's break it apart into the individual independent technologies and let's just build models or abstractions for those. Um, and so to do this, we started by uh, basically adopting the roles and profiles model. So roles and profiles, um, if you haven't been to a talk on it at uh, this conference yet, I'm sure there are like 10 or 13 of them that you can watch online in October. Uh, and it, the basic premise, you know, this is what was popularized by Craig Dunn's blog a couple of years ago and has since been expanded and blogged about by you know, everybody and their dog. Um, basic idea is we're going to adopt by convention a means of organizing our Puppet classes. A class is just a container in Puppet that allows you to create an interface. Um, and at the bottom level, we say resources, technologies. We're going to say uh, a Puppet module or a utility module or a technology module should be built that is very generic and represents the individual application. So things like Apache, MySQL, Tomcat. Um, we're going to build a module for this. It's extremely generic. It's kind of like an, uh, a package uh, from an operating system distribution, like the Red Hat Apache package or the Debian Apache package. This should be usable by everyone. It should present interfaces for it. It should not be opinionated in terms of like business logic. So nothing should be baked into this that's specific to your organization. Once you have the utility module, you then build on top of that um, what we call a profile. And a profile is kind of the, where the business logic actually goes. So in our case, we had a Puppet Master. A Puppet Master is using Apache. It's using Passenger. It is using, uh, what else is on that stack? It's using, I don't know, Puppet actually is an application that we have to care about. So we're gonna create a profile that ties together those three utility modules or those technologies into something business specific for our application. That's a profile. Um, profiles typically don't reference a whole lot of individual resources. They're referencing kind of the abstract building blocks we've created underneath them. So we went ahead and did that. We said, okay, great. We have a couple of different kind of things we want to model. Let's create a profile module for that. We're just kind of building our way up the stack. Eventually, we'll get to the multi-tier application part. Um, in the roles and profiles model, I'll mention that there is, I, so far I've talked about you know, utility modules and profiles. I haven't mentioned the word role. Role has always seemed a little bit fuzzier to me personally. Um, the definition of a role is a single class that is applied to a node that represents everything it needs to do. So every, uh, uh, if a node has a role, it should only ever have one role basically. Um, 
However, that paradigm is still a little bit node-centric. I'm not quite ready to talk about classification of individual nodes, so I'm going to bypass roles for a second, push it off to the side. What I really want to do is model in Puppet the thing I care about, which I've said today is the application, not the node. Okay? What I want to have is something like this. I want to represent this in uh, some sort of object in code that I can look at and feel and create an interface for. And so far, all I've done is break it apart into individual systems. Okay, so the next logical step, you know, so far, getting to this point, what we've done is we've started all the way up at saying, what's our basic building block? At first, it was resources. Let's build a, a class around that and call it technology. Once we, have, once, we have a, once we have a bunch of those, let's build a class around a few of those and call them a profile. So we're building up from our building up higher level abstractions from our uh, existing building blocks. So it makes sense then to say, why don't we go ahead and do the, continue doing that? Let's take all of our profiles that we care about and wrap them in another class with an interface, an abstraction, uh, that builds those out. There's a little bit of a problem here um, in that, uh, I guess, let me actually move on to the next slide before talking about that. I, what I want to have is, I don't want to actually deploy an application. I don't want to actually say these nodes um, should have these classes applied, because I don't want something real yet. I want something abstract. I want a blueprint. I want uh, something in code that's repeatable, identifiable as an application. I'm not actually ready to deploy it to a system or a group of systems. Okay? I want, again, this. So the objective is to model this in Puppet. I said, let's use a class. How do we do that? How do we actually represent the multi-tier application in the simplest container available to us, which is a Puppet class? Okay. Um, Future experiments aside, and sort of you know oddball projects out in the, in the wild, you can't actually, a profile is kind of something that is a node. A profile represents a system. And normally when you put something, a resource in a class, Puppet has the ability to create that or instantiate that um, on the target device. Well, I can't actually create or instantiate new nodes. I can't create instances of profiles. So we're gonna be kind of departing a little bit from the strict roles and profiles model at this point, although we're still using a class to represent the interface. So besides thinking of a profile as a persona um, or you know, a personality that you can apply to a node, another way of thinking about a profile is a bucket into which you can throw a bunch of nodes. Okay? So I can, I can take five nodes and put them in the Puppet Master bucket, and they'll all become Puppet Masters. I can model that that bucket is my profile, my resource abstraction. So although I can't model the rocks necessarily in a Puppet abstract class for an application, what I can do is I can say I can represent in a class the collection of buckets, or the collection of profi uh, profiles into which I might deploy real infrastructure. And I want to create this abstraction as an object I can think about. Okay? So for the Puppet Enterprise project, we said, let's actually try this. Let's see if it works. Um, and so let's create an abstract. Uh, I think the, the talk description might have warned you this was a slightly technical talk, so there is code on the next slide, a little bit of it. Um, let's actually create a class. I'm going, to call, I'm going to create a new module that represents my application. I'm going to call it PE. Uh, Puppet Enterprise. I'm then going to define a list of parameters, things I care about at the application layer. If I'm configuring an application, I care, for example, what port it's going to use to communicate on this vector, what port it's going to use for that service. Maybe what is the, the, uh, the, the, name, the service name for the application. You know, maybe this is going to be point, a load balancer kind of that distributes things, but what is the name? And for, a data, for database things, what is the database name and the username and password to connect to that database? Because multiple nodes are going to need to know that information, but I only want to configure it once in my application. Okay, so I'll create an interface that contains all of those things. This is an empty class. It's abstract. All it is is data. Then what I'll do is inside that same mo uh, module, I'll say, let's actually go ahead and place my profiles there. Let's create a profile um, for each of the different roles we want. So in the uh, picture I used, it was, you know, it, was a, it was a pile of buckets, right? And I said, I wanted to model the relationship between these things. So at the top level, here's what I care about as a whole. Uh, you can see we used class inheritance to actually say, uh, the Puppet Master needs to know what the port is, but I want it to default to my application to find port. So we use inheritance to kind of pull that down. Inheritance basically, as a side effect of how it works, allows me to reference the parent class's variables, which is why that's being used. We did that for pretty much every role in our application. Um, so what this should allow us to do is I'll kind of toss on the, on the screen here a slightly larger picture of that PE class so you can see more kinds of the variables that we assigned. We said, you know what, our application has a Puppet Master service. Here's what that is. It, are, it has a console service. Here's the information about that. It has a database, um, and here's the information about that. We kind of collected all of those application things. And then a slightly bigger picture of one of the application kind of component profiles. Um, these are incomplete. I'm just using them as a slightly bigger picture of the relationship slide I showed earlier. You know, for the Puppet Master, it's going to inherit everything that's common, everything that belongs to the application and not the individual. And then we start getting into the specific parameters that it has. A class is an interface, and this is really the most important part about building a model in Puppet, 
is a solid interface that we can use in abstraction to think about these things. So assuming all of that works, we've actually made a really good start on modeling the application, on modeling what um, or how to think about in an abstract way the thing that we want to have at the end of the day. So far, though, it's still pretty static. Um, we said this is what things should have, but if I want to actually put a bunch of nodes into, you know, a bunch of nodes into the Puppet Master bucket, how, how, does, how do those nodes actually get put behind the load balancer? Do I have to manually list them out in the interface? Ideally, no. Um, so we want to add a little bit of dynamism or elasticity to the model. Okay, I want this thing to automatically be able to figure out, okay, somebody put a bunch of nodes in the bucket, I want to automatically put them behind the load balancer and tell the database they exist so it'll authorize them. So how do you do that in Puppet? Um, the basic problem is we have a bunch of information that doesn't exist at the beginning of, you know, at the beginning of the application, and we need to have Puppet extract that and distribute it throughout the application. There's a couple of ways I know about how to do this. One of them um, is built into the product, and one of them is not. So given the context we were working in, we had to choose exported resources as the mechanism we would go with. Um, I'll mention the other one. Uh, Eric, uh, I forget how to pronounce his last name, but it's like Dalian, Dalian. Um, has a Puppet DB query module on the forge that I'll mention in a second, but we stuck with exported resources for now. Exported resources um, is basically the, the built-in method of allowing Puppet to distribute information from one node to another. I'll try and walk through what that looks like. I found it a really complicated concept when I first started working with Puppet, and it seems like kind of a weird paradigm, because in order to get information from one system, say the Puppet master, so we have a load balancer situation. Each, the load balancer needs to know about every master in the environment, it needs to know their IP addresses so it can appropriately route to them. How does it get that? The way we do this is when we configure the master itself, we start by saying, you know, master, you might be placed behind a load balancer. And so what you need to do is you have access to all of your information. You know your IP address, you know your host name, you know your certificate name. You need to pretend for a second that you're a load balancer. If you were a load balancer, how would you configure yourself behind, you know, as, as a balancer uh, pool member? This is an exported resource. An exported resource is basically a virtual definition. Um, and the reason this has to be done this way is in Puppet, we have a principle of least privilege model, which means no node actually has access to or can look up by default any information about any other node in the, in, in the environment. Okay? So we can't just start at the load balancer and say, look for all the Puppet masters and grab their IP addresses and configure them in your list. The, puppet, uh, the load balancer can't do that because it can't see the other node's information. So we have to start by saying other nodes Please publish your information explicitly. And exported resources are not just giving data up, they're saying, here's what it would look like, a resource would look like that would appropriately configure a load balancer if I were one. And let's publish that to a database, which is PuppetDB or store configs. That word store configs, you might see a little bit. I think we're actually in the process of trying to kill it um, in favor of just calling it straight exported resources and not worrying about it. Then the load balancer because it can't explicitly look up other in, uh, nodes' information, has to say, what has already been published? Um, please, Puppet Master, tell me about um, any resources of type, in this case I'm using a, a, an example called pool member, look for any pool member resources that have been published that match a particular filter. So I might say, I, my application instance ID is development one. Please look for any exported resources from application development one for Puppet Master pool members and give them to me. And then what it will do is it will actually realize those virtual resources and create the list. There's a lot of documentation on this. I, I thought about, you know, how do I actually explain this quickly in a 40-minute talk? I made a slide, um, which, actually, here's what the code looks like, so there's another way of looking at it. Um, you know, the Puppet Master is actually gonna publish a resource that has its personal IP address on it, and then the, the load balancer is going to actually kind of pull that down and uh, realize it. Uh, but the documentation goes into much more detail if you haven't seen this pattern before and wanna learn more about how it works. But again, the basic premise is this is the built-in method of distributing information dynamically from one system to another. The alternative, um, if you can't, uh, or if you don't want to do that, I said, it makes a lot, I guess the defining characteristics of this approach is that you have to think about this dynamic relationship from both perspectives. You can't just look at the load balancer and say, in configuring the load balancer, it should have the Puppet Master's IP addresses. You can't just say that here because you can't look at the Puppet Master's IP addresses. Eric Dalen's Puppet DB query module from the Forge actually enables that use case. It says, you know what, a Puppet Master should be able to just look for raw data about other nodes. It shouldn't have to look for information nodes have published about themselves. So Puppet DB query allows the master to actually say, just do a search for all of the master nodes in this application instance and then give me their IP addresses. This would potentially have been a very compelling approach for us, but in the context of what we were doing, we were trying to limit dependencies on external applications and so we stuck with exported resources. They're both functionally the same, um, it just depends on what paradigm makes the most sense to you. 
Regardless of what you choose, um, whenever you're distributing information around multiple nodes in Puppet, something you have to be aware of is its eventual consistency model and what that means. What it boils down to is every Puppet run, the node has exactly one opportunity to give the master information about itself. And the master's job is to build a holistic picture of the environment. So when the, no when the node starts the run, it's going to send all the facts down to the Puppet master. And this includes what is my IP address, what is my um, you know, certificate name, and if the, we wanted to export, like let's say we have an application that requires a uh, key pair to be generated on the node, and then we need to just distribute that public key to other systems. How do we do that? Typically, we're going to say, generate the key pair. So the master says, you should have a key pair. Well, in this interaction, the only way to get information back to the master is during that fact run. So if, if we, the node says, here I am, I'm blank. It hasn't been able to give the master its public key because it doesn't have one. The master says, you should have a public key. Node says, great, but that ends the puppet run. And the master won't know what the public key is that the node generates until the next run begins. Which, you know, if you're firing two runs in quick, quick succession is great, but typically puppet runs only every 30 minutes, so you have this sort of delay if you're not intentionally uh, paying attention to that. So puppet might take more than one run to reach consistency because a node can only update the master once per run. That's something to be aware of. It has implications around, you know, how do you get to a final consistent state if you're not centrally defining all of the information. So that's where I'm going to stop for how do you actually define and think about a multi-tier application. Again, the basic premise was let's create an abstract thing in code we can think about as the app, and then how do we actually dynamically gener you know, send information between nodes. I showed a couple of you know, um, the mechanisms for doing that, and one of the things, to, uh, constraints and considerations to keep in mind. So once we have a definition, how do we actually apply this to a group of nodes? You know, maybe I have 10 nodes. They're freshly spun up. They got nothing on them. How do I take this application definition and put it on the nodes? I'll toss a definition of set on here for a second, but I'm not going to talk about it um, just yet. Fundamentally, what you would want to do in an ideal situation is, you know what, we have this abstract thing called an application, and it is effectively a collection of containers, and it applies to everything um, that we have. So this application instance, let's apply it to all these 10 nodes. It's an abstract class. All it does is set data. It doesn't do anything. So by applying it, we've done nothing. Right? And then what we can do is start subdividing those 10 nodes into, here is my puppet master group. Five, five nodes go in there. Here is my, my puppet DB um, app profile. Uh, one node goes in there. Here's my load balancer profile. One node goes in there, the simplest case. That would be great. In that case, we'd have a, a single group up top that had the, application, the abstract um, application definition and then kind of subgroups underneath it. If you're doing this in an external node classifier, um, so I guess conceptually, I'll, I'll mention that's pretty much, it seems like the sanest way to do it. However, there are a bunch of, this is about how to do this, this in Puppet today, so I have to go down the path of what makes this not work how you'd expect right now. Um, and the simplest answer is, in an external node classifier, whether it's the, you know, the, the node classifier we're talking about for 3.4 or the existing PE console or something entirely different, uh, the, no, the classifier's job is to pass back a set of classes um, and their parameters to the Puppet Master, which means you have no guarantee, and since it's a set, um, of the order in which those classes will begin. If I say you should be a member of the, of the abstract application and you should be a member of this particular profile, that's two items in the set. Unfortunately, it turns out that evaluation order matters um, when using parameterized classes. If anybody's used parameterized classes a lot, you've already run into this pain potentially. Um, if you say first, the, the abstract application class PE should be defined, and by the way, here's some piece of data about it. I'm just using instance ID as a, as a simple kind of one-liner. And then, this particular node should also, as a, besides being in this abstract group, it should also have the particular profile applied to it. That'll work. It'll instantiate the PE class, give it its parameters, and then instantiate the subcomponent profile and give it its parameters. It'll inherit from PE, and everything will be golden. However, if they are inversed, if you first say you should have the particular Puppet Master profile, what'll happen is it'll say this Puppet Master profile inherits from this abstract thing called PE. So I'm going to set the Puppet Master's variables, but I'm going to have to instantiate a new PE class because it doesn't exist in the catalog yet, and it's going to have all blank um, parameters. And then, going back up to the classifier, you should have PE. Puppet Master is going to say, wait a second, I already have that class in the catalog. Duplicate class declaration. Um, error. Bailout. Abort. Abort. Um, basically, because evaluation order matters, we have to find some other means of ensuring that the parameters are appropriately applied kind of abstractly to the application and then the specifics passed down to the individual profiles. There's two ways that we thought about doing this. Um, and the first way was, well, we already have this application out there that basically exists for partitioning um, nodes into groups and then assigning not classes to nodes but rather parameters to classes, and that application is Hira. Okay, so one way that we thought about initially was, well, wait, why don't we actually just take Hira, 
let's add to our hierarchy some sort of application instance ID and say, Pyre's about subdividing, right? So here's all of our nodes. We already subdivide using higher things into you know, the environment here is production and development. Why don't we go ahead and subdivide those further into individual application instances? Functionally, this works. And what you do then is you say, for the application dev1, here's a list of parameters for the, for the um, PE class. And using automatic parameter lookup in Hira and Puppet, this will appropriately assign the parameters regardless of what order um, if you, you know, assign a specific profile to a node and it inherits PE, it'll instantiate PE and look in Hira for those values. This will work, um, but it ends up meaning you can't necessarily use the node classifier, that you, uh, your, your interface, to create simple groups and say, this is application group one, 10 nodes, we'll subdivide them, this app application instance two, you know, 10 more nodes, we'll subdivide them. Uh, because higher is today largely about, uh, I think you, you have to choose a higher backend and it's not your classifier. This is actually what we chose to do for our um, implementation because uh, when you're puppetizing something like Puppet Enterprise itself, there's typically only going to be one in the environment. Um, so it was really easy. We just said, in general, here's the list of class parameters. But it was, would have been hard to subdivide by application instances. So the other possible approach, and this is a little bit of a hack, but I'll just mention it since it's uh, relatively straightforward, is previously I said, you know what, here's the application interface, and I'm not going to set defaults for any of these. I could have said something instead like, here's the application interface, and you know what, if I haven't specified a parameter, you should look for a global variable of the same name. What this means is that in your classifier, when you add the abstract class, you can also add a list of global variables. Um, this happens to work. It seems like functionally very equivalent. Um, it's a little bit uglier, but I'll mention that it's a possibility. We chose Hira, like I said, um, but that's another avenue you could explore. So you said anchor them in a role. Uh, so we can definitely, I actually have a slide on anchors um, in the very end, but unfortunately I don't think it works for classification yet. So that helps once you get actually get down to deploying it. Like if you wanted all the profiles on a single system and you wanted that ordered correctly. Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about that towards the end. Um, but that's you know, classification. So assuming I want to split all this across, how do, I do, how do I put all the nodes in the right buckets and have them inherit a single data interface? Um, the last thing I was going to mention was actually great. We've defined something abstractly, a blueprint for not the simple node, but for you know, conceptually the application. Um, we've figured out a couple of means of actually applying that. You know, to a, a subset or a context of nodes saying these, these nodes are the application instance and here's their individual roles. Um, but then how do you actually deploy that? If, all I said, if I did a typical you know, Puppet workflow, I'd say let's spin up a node and let's add it to a group and it's going to get this class and then Puppet will just kind of run on its own schedule and everything will be good. But in the case of a multi-tier application, you actually have um, ordering. Uh, you know, in, in Puppet, you know, Puppet uses the DAG or the directed acyclic graph to handle ordering. You say if I'm going to deploy this package and this file and this service, the package uh, needs to come before the file, and the service is subscribed to the file, and so Puppet builds a graph that correctly orders all of these resources together. But the directed acyclic graph, the DAG, is also node-centric, which means when we start breaking things apart uh, across multiple nodes, we can't just use metaparameters to worry about ordering, because uh, if the, uh, the Puppet master is not going to have any relationship at all in the DAG to the Puppet DB system. So how does Puppet actually run on systems? Um, Puppet, a Puppet agent will run one of kind of three basic ways, um, uh, kind of in the wild and out of the box. And the first way is by default it's going to run on a, on a clock. Once every 30 minutes a Puppet agent run is going to happen. So if I started with 10 nodes and just classified them and let it go, configuration would kind of start happening. I wouldn't really have a whole lot of control over when or where it happened, but it would start happening. Alternatively, Puppet runs if somebody manually throws a switch. Somebody SSHs to the box and runs 8 Puppet agent dash T, Puppet will run exactly then and there on that box. And finally, um, Puppet agents you know, might run if some external orchestrator, in this case, this is a picture from the M Collective documentation, if people aren't familiar with it. This is my favorite picture of M Collective. Um, you can use some external utility like M Collective to say, okay, we're going to centrally take control of the Puppet run schedule. Maybe we'll say, you know, um, generically, blanket statement, temporarily pause your scheduled runs, and then on my cadence, you run, you run, you run, you run. So that's another option, is some central um, system can take control of the Puppet runs, and that's kind of the only ways Puppet agent might run on a system. In the case of our application, if we just classified it and let it go, we'd actually end up where we wanted to be in about an hour and a half. And the reason for that is Puppet's eventual consistency model. Our application was pretty robust. Um, although it wouldn't work if you didn't have every tier deployed, it also wouldn't break horribly. Um, so if we just classified 10 nodes and let them run, let's say the Puppet Masters came up first, you know what, they, the additional masters probably wouldn't work for a little while. Okay, I guess I have to time out here for a second. 
I'm using Puppet Enterprise as my example because that's what we were building. I'm completely leaving out the fact that we had a bootstrap problem to go along with this. Um, but if this were some other multi-tier application, um, and you already had the Puppet infrastructure working, and you brought up the first um, tier of the application, you know, the middleware tier, it might not work yet, but it would be halfway configured. You brought up the next tier, and then the next time Puppet run in the middleware tier, it would say, hey, wait a second, I can finish configuring myself because this other backend exists. And you'd eventually get to a point where everything worked with another Puppet run. That's the eventual consistency model. Um, obviously, at the very least, this is a little bit ugly, and it takes a lot of time. Even if we said we were okay with the eventual consistency, you know, maybe we can speed things up by saying, okay, fine, we're gonna have some errors and runs, but we just need Puppet to run three times total and we'll have consistency. So let's just go once, fire from mCollective or something else, run Puppet. So here's a single directive. Just everywhere, try and synchronize yourselves. And then, you know, 20 seconds later, let's do it again. Everybody try and synchronize yourselves. And then 20 seconds later, again, everybody try and synchronize yourselves. By the end of that, you probably have it working, but you know, if you had a more, if you had a less, less robust application or something that might generate inconsistencies in the meantime, this is not necessarily what you wanna do. So what you really want to do is somehow figure out a way to say, I just set up you know, these new systems and I classified them, but maybe centrally I've said, Puppet, you know what, don't go until I tell you to. I'm going to control your cadence. I want Puppet to run first on the future database servers, go. And then when they're finished, then Puppet's going to say, okay, great, run on the future web app servers, go. Finally, you know, the WW servers, the load balancer, go. What we discovered in trying to puppetize this is Puppet obviously doesn't have a good solution for today for uh, specific ordering across multiple systems. So we have to have something um, that actually takes central control if we want to be, if we want to tightly control the Puppet runs. The cool thing though about modeling it in Puppet, this multi-tier application, is that we have uh, kind of done what you want to do with Puppet, which is reduce and compartmentalize your problems. At this point, what's left for us to figure out in an external tool is notice the action that we're taking on each system. We've got to take an ordered run. Well, all we're doing on each system is we're pushing the synchronize button. We're saying, go puppet, go puppet, go puppet, which means we can do something much, you know, we don't have to worry about the details since puppet is handling that now that we've defined the multi-tier application and classified it. The last remaining problem is how do we actually order runs? Once the runs are ordered, you can actually release these systems kind of from your central control node, whatever it happens to be. Puppet will pick up its regular cadence and then you have your usual Puppet benefits, which is it's making sure things are consistent um, across the application. If something changes on a particular node, it'll change it back, it'll alert you of that configuration drift. Um, so you're getting the, the usual benefits. You know, why would you actually want to do this in the first place? Those sorts of benefits. There's complications around actually deploying it, but at the end, um, if you get it done, you're, you're still getting all the usual Puppet kind of uh, accomplishments. So just to kind of um, summarize um, that run through this particular structure of the talk, the idea again was to present um, way, ways of thinking about how you'd actually puppetize or use Puppet on a multi-tier application, kind of exposing what the points of integration are, where you might want to think about using an external tool or what you have to actually take into mind when you're doing it in terms of how to actually define the application. You know, the most important thing was um, ideally you'd want to find a way of thinking about and defining the application as a whole in addition to worrying about subdividing the nodes into their you know, respective roles. Um, and as far as classifying it, great, you've built your, your definition, but how do you actually sort the nodes into the correct buckets? Because it's actually a, not quite a trivial task due to the way the part evaluation order works in Puppet in the classifier. And then how do you actually deploy the system, especially if it's order dependent? Um, as far as anchors, um, there's a lot of little, little tips and tricks um, that we found when we're breaking this out. So I talked, and I don't have time to get into all of them, but this one uh, I just tossed on the screen as an example. Um, we talked about, you know, we said we broke apart the technologies. We had the Puppet Masters, the Puppet DB, and the front end, and that we talked about all the problems in deploying them to multiple systems. But if we want to use the same code to deploy them onto one system, we actually do solve the ordering problem um, because we can start using the DAG again, that directed acyclic graph. We can now specify relationships between them. We can make statements like the database server needs to be up and functioning before you actually try and connect the web, app web application to it. Okay. We wanted to make it so that you could deploy um, all of the applications to independent nodes and use the same code to deploy all of the profiles to, the, to a single node. Um, and the way we kind of figure out to do this is, you know, this abstract class we built, let's add even more abstract things to it. Anchors are a resource in Puppet that allows you to be very explicit about that graph. Anchor does nothing. All it is is something you can specify dependencies against. You can say things like, you know what, I'm gonna create this barrier anchor. And the reason I call it barrier, by the way, is because it turns out when you're using something as expressive as Puppet, names are hugely important. Um, and barrier was the best way I could think about, you know, I want some things to happen before this and some things to happen after it. So in, I, I took computer science in college, so I'm gonna call it a barrier. 
Um, and this allows us to say things like, you know what, all of the certificate authority profile needs to happen before this barrier. And all of the puppet master stuff, which requires a certificate authority, is actually going to come after this barrier. And both of those can specify these dependencies. And if one exists on a node, great. If they both exist on a node, they'll be in the correct order. Um, if nothing exists on the node, no damage is done. So this is one kind of way of building a virtual skeleton that we can anchor things against if we want to have the ability to spin up a development node with everything on it and use the same code to spin up kind of a production instance across an arbitrary number of systems. Um, there are other little patterns like that. I didn't put any of them on slides because, uh, again, I discovered after, I, I wrote the abstract for this talk, you know, three months ago when we were kind of in the middle of finishing up the project. I was like, we, we're going to find something out that's really interesting and I'm going to talk about it. But I had no idea what it was yet. Um, and it turns out that 40 minutes wasn't a whole lot of time to, uh, to try and present. So I opted for getting across a consistent message, which was, again, how do we actually think about it? You know, model the application as a class, um, something you think about directly as an entity instead of just the nodes. Um, assign parameters to the application, not just to the nodes. Um, how do you actually classify that? And then if you have, uh, you know, uh, if you have a, the word fragile is wrong. If you have a class that, if an application that is really um, strict about sort of when things come up, you need to take central control of Puppet run schedule. Um, in the simplest case, you just, you know, you're bringing up new nodes, bring up the first new nodes and run Puppet. And when they're done, bring up the new nodes again and you'll kind of have an automatic scheduler that way. Um, but somehow you have to take that into consideration or accept and deal with the eventual consistency. So I think that was pretty much everything I wanted to convey. So I'll go ahead and open up for the last couple of minutes for any questions. We've got a microphone here, so if there are any questions, hand up and I'll pass you the microphone. It might be right, right down the front. Hi. So do you have this as a working example somewhere online? Yeah, yeah. So the, other, so the other thing, I, I said in the abstract, this is a working example. We actually did finish the pilot project and did finish the application. Unfortunately, that isn't public. It's uh, professional services at Puppet, at Puppet Labs deploy, has de deployed the system systems, and we're using it to kind of merge into our existing production um, stuff. But this code is not public. Um, I will say, if you want to check out a, an application that does use this kind of uh, architecture, check out the OpenStack modules. Um, because they use basically the same principles. Um, you know, it's a much more complicated project than this ended up being. Uh, so it's a I, I realize it's kind of an ambitious, you know, you should go look at this massive battleship. Um, uh, but unfortunately, I don't have this code available online right now. I'm sorry. So you mentioned you use exported resources. Are your puppet masters, um, do you have a different set of puppet masters per environment, app environment? So there is an issue with exported resources right now, which is that PuppetDB is not um, environment aware, which means if you have you know, a QA environment and a production environment and they're just blindly collecting resources, they could potentially take things from uh, you know, QA into production. Um, in this uh, example, I, was kinda, I kept tossing out things like application instance ID. Um, since we were thinking about how do we deploy more than one of these, we'd use that as a tag to limit our collection which means if we have an instance deployed in production, it's called you know, dev1, or excuse me, instance deployed in dev called dev1, um, then it would only collect masters you know, for that instance. Um, but if you don't have that and you're trying to collect everything, then I think in PuppetDB, I don't know what version it was, they did add environment support um, or they're working on it, uh, but we did not ad address that in this project. Thank you. So when you talked about uh, exported resources, so if your load balancer has like four puppet masters and if you want to remove one of the puppet masters, exported resources takes care of that or? Yes, so when you define, I guess, yes, conditionally, when you define um, how you actually manage the, uh, um, the, the balancer pool, um, puppet has the, you know, the, the, uh, the concept of purging. And so typically you would actually define something in a way that it was purged. So every time the, the load balancer is synchronized when it runs puppet, not only is it going to look for the instances that are defined, it's also going to have those instances set to purge. So anything it doesn't find anymore will be automatically removed. And that's a very important pattern when using this, because otherwise you're not really going to have very useful dyna um, dynamism or elasticity. We've got time for one more question. It's a, a lucky winner over here. Uh, Reed, you talked about um, the sort of external orchestration something. Um, can you go in a little more detail about what it was that you used to punch each of the nodes for orchestration? Yeah. Uh, so I mentioned, yeah, I mentioned um, out of the box, you know, for our customers, they have access to, you know, Puppet Labs has the M Collective thing, which is just, it's really, 
Although it's kind of complicated if it's set up, it's a simple command and control utility. We had a bootstrapping problem where for this particular project, we didn't have Puppet, we didn't have mQuickt, we had nothing when we started. So we actually were using SSH. We were saying, let's SSH and um, trigger this on, uh, we have to get a minimal Puppet environment working before we can start deploying out kind of the elastic layers. So we actually set up the certificate authority as a master, set up the Puppet DB system. And once we had that, that was enough to get everything else started. Um, but because we were bootstrapping, we had a separate issue. Um, if we were deploying this application uh, you know, to say it was an, an application that wasn't Puppet itself and we didn't have to worry about bootstrapping Puppet in the, uh, kind of in the meantime, uh, I wouldn't make it, like I don't, I, I intentionally didn't make any specific recommendations to external technologies. I just said this is what Puppet can do and where you need to find something else. Um, but anything, that's, it's basically SSH in a for loop type stuff that we use for bootstrapping. Okay, that's, we're gonna have to uh, wrap it up there. Thank you, Reid, great job. Thanks. Uh,